Okay, it's four o'clock and we are live. So welcome to the UCLA Anderson Forecast webinar series. This is an occasional webinar series where we explore major issues affecting the economy today and in the future. And what could be more timely than talking about the energy industry uh, today? And so we have uh, with us as our guest, uh, Mike Worth. Mike is CEO and chairman of the board of the Chevron Company. Uh, Mike graduated in chemical engineering from the University of Colorado, one of my alma maters, in 1982 and joined the Chevron Corporation in the same year. Uh, he's served as an executive at Chevron in many different capacities, including managing supply chains, international operations, strategy, and was elected to his current positions by the board in 2017, took those positions in February of 2018. Uh, he also serves on the boards of uh, many uh, professional and charitable organizations, including the American Petroleum Institute, the International Business Council of the World Economic Forum, and the American Heart Association CEO Roundtable. Uh, so welcome to UCLA, Mike. Well, thanks, Jerry. I, uh, I only have one alma mater, not many, as you do, and I only have worked for one company. So uh, maybe not quite as uh, interesting from that point of view as your career, but it's great to be here. Uh, mine is maybe more unstable than yours. Um, but, Mike, let's turn to our subject of the day, and in particular, the last two and a half years. So during your career, uh, you managed all aspects of Chevron, uh, but it, it's, you know, kind of no stretch to say that the last two and a half years have been unusual, difficult, uh, unexpected, starting with the pandemic, and you had a collapse of demand for uh, gasoline, for jet fuel, and then a recovery that was more rapid than many people expected. Uh, and then on the heels of that, a war in Ukraine and with the Russian invasion, and interruption of a large supply of petroleum to the world. Uh, as, as CEO, how do you manage through uh, these kinds of disruptions in your business, and and how do you look at that as you go forward? Yeah, you know, it's it's fascinating, and some people will say, and in many ways, I think the last couple of years have been unprecedented. On, on the other hand, our company has been around for 143 years. In fact, we were founded in Pico Canyon in Southern California, not all that far from uh, UCLA. And, uh, and, and so since 1879, we've seen world wars, we've seen pandemics, we've seen depressions, uh, we've seen a lot. And uh, one of the things that I try to do is remind our people of the history of our industry, the history of our company. And, uh, and so we've survived these, these uh, great uh, and unexpected periods of time. It's a cyclical industry. And one of the things that you can never uh, forget are the fundamentals. And in our business, it's about protecting people and the environment. It's about capital discipline. It's about cost discipline and excellence in execution. You can control the things that you can control. And our company has long had a very consistent set of values, uh, a culture of being prepared. For any environment and, and being adaptive to evolving, um, evolving markets and societal expectations. If I go back to March of 2020, I remember it very well. On March 3rd, I was kind of starting my third year as a CEO, feeling pretty good. The company was performing well. We thought we had a good plan. We met with investors in New York and we handed out um, hand sanitizer because there was this new thing we were beginning to hear about. And, uh, but we laid out our capital plans, our, our commitments to our investors. Uh, I went from uh, that meeting in New York to a meeting in Florida at the end of the week with a group of CEOs that I meet with twice a year, where we uh, present to each other about 35 CEOs from different industries. And um, we, we all have to, it's the most stressful presentation I give because it's the toughest audience. Uh, but at that meeting, uh, there was a CEO from the, uh, uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry who had gone to school with uh, people in China who said, let me tell you what I'm hearing from inside China. Uh, there was a CEO of one of the major airlines who said, we've never seen forward bookings plummet as quickly as we have over the last seven to 10 days. Uh, one of the big uh, credit card companies, same thing, forward cancellations and bookings unprecedented, even compared to 9-11. And so as I left this meeting, we'd gone from laying out our plan 
uh, to this uh, kind of bracing set of data that were not yet out in the public domain. And on my flight home, uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia uh, had a, a falling out at an OPEC meeting and the Saudis made the biggest price cuts in the history of uh, Saudi Arabia to their, and you could see this collapse in prices, the collapse in demand and, and, and these signs on the horizon. And on Monday, I got my executive team together and we took a business plan we'd worked on for months to present to investors. And we basically had to throw in the trash and over the next 10 days, completely reframe uh, our capital spending, our priorities and prepare for this very turbulent time. Uh, we did that because I've seen this movie before and, uh, and knew what to do. And I'm also fortunate to have my three immediate predecessors, each of whom served for almost a decade, uh, still alive. And, and I'm on very good terms with them so I can reach out and get advice. And so, uh, you know, you navigate these times by relying on uh, the perspective that uh, your history brings and then staying true to the fundamentals and the values uh, of your industry. And, uh, and in a cyclical industry, if you do that, uh, you know, you can survive the, the, the most unexpected and challenging circumstances. So that your story about the way in which the first two weeks in March unfolded uh, resonated because while you were in New York, we were releasing a fairly optimistic forecast for the US economy. And uh, while you were in Florida, we did something unprecedented which was uh, within 10 days, completely changed our forecast and called a recession at that time. So things did change very fast at that time. Uh, I, I'd like to dig into some of the things that you said. And, and the first is, uh, is that Chevron, your company is, um, is a global company. It has a culturally, ethnically, geographically uh, diverse workforce and diverse uh, constituency. Uh, and over the last five years or so, we've seen real polarization, not just in the US, but internationally. And so I'm interested in how you lead your team through these kinds of, of uh, events that are affecting human resources. And what is it that you've learned from this experience? Yeah, it's a, it's a turbulent time. Things like social media accelerate, social media 24 hour news accelerate, uh, you know, stories and, um, uh, and, and magnify issues very, very dramatically. Uh, you know, once again, I'll go back to our history and, and our culture. Uh, we have a document that's called the Chevron Way, which guides our, our values, uh, our purpose, speaks to our, our vision and uh, how we behave. And at the core of that, uh, diversity and inclusion is the very first value that we talk about. It's at the heart of our culture, uh, valuing the uniqueness and diversity of individual talents, experiences, backgrounds, ideas. And, uh, and with that as an underpinning, uh, it really fosters open and honest conversations that invite different voices to be heard, that respect different points of view. Uh, really important in solving complex business issues uh, because oftentimes uh, framing it uh, in a different way helps you see a, a different set of uh, options and, and solutions. Uh, and, and so it also helps us with the um, kind of the, the, you know, the societal issues that, that you refer to and some of the things that uh, polarize society today. Uh, because with 40,000 people around the world, every opinion that you hear about uh, externally in the media, that exists somewhere within our workforce. And, uh, and so uh, this diversity of perspectives is the reality. We reflect society uh, and our people reflect all of those differences. Uh, what we do is within the company, uh, make sure that we uh, have a place for these open and honest conversations. They're not always comfortable. Uh, they're uh, oftentimes difficult, uh, particularly when they get into areas of, of politics and, and strongly held uh, political views, but our, our leaders and our workforce, uh, they, they support one another. They, they understand that um, uh, respecting uh, the views of their colleagues is uh, fundamental to our culture. And, uh, and we look for common ground and there's, there's always more that we can agree on than, than we disagree on. And, uh, and, and so it's, uh, it's a healthy, uh, but sometimes uncomfortable uh, set of conversations. It would be nice if we could extend that more generally to the uh, country at large. Uh, 
another thing that you referred to when you were talking about the history of Chevron and the, the changes that have been occurring, there are quite a few changes that are happening today in the energy industry. Uh, so how do you see that playing out uh, through, say, the first half of the 21st century, the next 30 years? Yeah, you hear a lot of talk these days about the energy transition <clears throat> as if it's um, something new. And if you actually study the energy system in the world, it's always been in transition. Uh, and the, uh, you know, the two drivers that are, are constants through that are ever increasing demand as the population of the planet uh, has grown as uh, the economies uh, around the world have developed, uh, energy is a fundamental input and so demand has always increased. Uh, and the second constant has been a desire to see less environmental impact uh, over that period of time. And so if you go back 200 years, peat moss and biomass were the primary sources uh, of energy, supplanted by coal or augmented really by coal, by oil, by natural gas, nuclear, wind, solar, uh, geothermal, a whole range of things that we see today that have offered a, a new set of solutions. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, uh, affordable, reliable, and ever cleaner energy is, uh, is, is at the core of um, the energy transition that's been underway uh, for a very long, long time. And today, it's in sharp uh, definition as we look at the, 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 this enormous dual challenge to meet the growing demand for energy uh, from a growing world, and at the same time, reducing emissions to, uh, to try to achieve the ambitions of the Paris Agreement and to do those simultaneously. Uh, the scale of the energy system is hard to describe even to people that, that work in it. Um, sometimes uh, I tell people next time you're on a flight, particularly in the evening, this is when you know, I often reflect on it, when you're landing somewhere at an airport and you just look down and you realize how many people uh, live in this area that you're visiting and you look at the roads and the buildings and the lights and you, you realize it's on all the time. And this is just one place in this, this great big uh, you know, world that we live in. And so providing economies uh, with the affordable energy that allows uh, economic prosperity and development uh, that provides countries with uh, reliable and secure supplies, which is uh, clearly a, a big issue today with what's going on in Eastern Europe and, and some of the issues that, uh, that the world is facing as a result of that. And then the challenge to uh, protect the environment with cleaner energy. It is, uh, it is the great challenge to our industry of our time. And it's something that uh, you know, we spend uh, every hour of every day working on. So let's explore that a little bit more. My colleague at uh, Berkeley, Severin Bornstein, mm -hmm. uh, has uh, made the case that uh, as we in the United States and, Euro and those in Europe move away from uh, petroleum, that the price of petroleum will be coming down to the point where uh, it simply makes sense for folks with lower incomes and certainly countries that are developing countries to rely uh, still rely heavily on uh, on petroleum as an energy source. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it, predicting prices is very hard. And uh, as I'm sure uh, Severin would tell you, uh, the reality is the energy system we have today uh, is in place uh, because it served society's needs to this point in time. And uh, you know, the existing, particularly the petroleum-based economy for transportation, is, uh, is very um, useful in, in, in a couple of dimensions. It's, it's very affordable versus the alternatives. And liquid fuels are very energy dense and portable. And when it comes to transportation, particularly as you get into um, things beyond just light duty vehicles, which you'll get heavy duty vehicles, ships, planes, um, energy density, range, portability become fundamental. And, and batteries and some of the other technologies uh, just have not been able to compete with liquid fuels on those characteristics. So I think what we're going to see is a world where uh, there will be different solutions in, in different locations for sure. Uh, the developing world uh, can't afford the same things that developed countries can, and they prioritize uh, affordability uh, and, and the fundamental uh, progress that that enables in their economies. Uh, at a higher level than they than they do um, the environment, the same way our country did uh, 100 years ago, 
And, uh, and as you look at the cycle of development around the world, this is a, this is a very common pattern. And so I think, I think his conclusion is uh, broadly one that uh, I would agree with, unless and until we develop technologies that can offer the same benefits at a comparable cost for societies that just don't have the wealth uh, to afford a more expensive solution. And we're working on that. Lots of smart people at UCLA, at Cal, and, and around the world are, are working hard to try to develop solutions that have less environmental impact are more affordable and can be deployed at scale to, to the point earlier about the scale of the energy system. So, so let's bring it back from the middle of the 20th century to the near term. Uh, we all know that gasoline prices are, uh, are high. That's a complaint of many people, even though when you adjust for inflation, they're not historically high, uh, but they are much higher than they have been recently. And there's been a push for more oil being extracted and coming to market uh, including the Biden administration urging OPEC to produce more and releasing oil from the U.S. Strategic Reserve. Uh, what are the issues for Chevron in being able to expand production in the near term and considerations for Chevron with regard to investment in long-term oil production? Yeah, really, really topical issues today. So we're growing our, our production in the U.S. and the quarter just ended the first quarter of 22, our domestic production was up 10% over the same quarter in, in the prior year. So we're actually uh, contributing to, to more supply growth. The market needs uh, more than just one company obviously can, can produce. Um, we're, we've got a very large position in the Permian Basin, which grew to our highest production levels ever there, nearly 700,000 barrels a day last quarter. Uh, in the near term, the, the reality that we're facing is um, in energy, supply always responds more slowly than demand. And this was true in 2020 when demand collapsed as economies shut down. We had negative oil prices in April of 2020 uh, at a point when uh, it looked like there might not be a place to store the oil that was being produced because demand had contracted so sharply that tanks were filling up. People were chartering ships to serve as floating storage tanks. Uh, and so supply contracted, but not nearly as quickly as demand did. And then the reverse, happened a you know, few quarters later as economies opened back up and, um, and, and the supply that had been uh, constrained now was uh, insufficient to meet this demand that was rebounding so strongly. Uh, one of the challenges in the US, for instance, is, uh, and I've talked to the Secretary of Energy and others about this in the administration, uh, the Permian Basin War I mentioned, we're, we're still very active. A lot of companies shut down their operations there, which means that the drilling contractors took their rigs and stack them up in storage areas. The rigs that continued to work, uh, when they needed maintenance or parts, they would cannibalize the rigs that were not in service. And so as we look now to bring more rigs back out to work, uh, the reality is the rig fleet that has been um, sidelined isn't prepared to come back to work. Uh, the supply chain issues that uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure have talked about, uh, impact this industry. A lot of the people that, uh, that worked uh, in that part of the country took their COVID checks and their you know, uh, uh, other forms of support, moved to a different part of the country and to remobilize the workforce requires incentives and time. And so there's a whole series of things that now as we look to step activity levels back up are very real constraints in our sector of the economy as they are in, in many others. People are working hard on this, but it doesn't respond as, as quickly as the demand comes back, which is why we see the, uh, the pressure on prices. In, in the longer term, uh, one of the biggest issues that we face is um, views of energy in the long term. And you've mentioned the Biden administration is encouraging near-term production, but at the same time, they're discouraging long-term production. And we get conflicting signals from policymakers and from investors, frankly, uh, about what they want. The decisions that we make for capital investment generally have a lifespan of decades. And if uh, people are raising serious questions about the future of your business a few decades out, uh, those decisions become much more difficult for companies to make. Uh, they make them more cautiously. Uh, investors uh, have uh, clearly preferred a return of capital to, uh, to them as opposed to a deployment of capital and growth in this sector. And, uh, and so I think the industry in the uh, medium to longer term uh, is going to be challenged with a policy and, um, and shareholder environment that sends mixed signals about uh, what they expect and about how they see the future of energy unfolding. And if that 
Um, if that reduces uh, the investment in new supply, what it could do would be to extend these kind of fundamental conditions that we see today for, for a longer period of time than otherwise would have been the case um, you know, in past cycles. So in that regard, uh, what kinds of policies might the government, ours and other governments, uh, follow to provide uh, more certainty for your investors uh, and at the same time guide uh, at least U.S. energy production in the direction that the Paris Accords have suggested it should go and that uh, many people think that it should go? Yeah, it's a, it's a really um, active debate uh, on what those policies would look like. Uh, my view is they need to support solutions that can scale because uh, solutions that work only at uh, kind of at the, the local level uh, really can't uh, move the needle on, on a market this big. Uh, we need policies that encourage innovation and, uh, and accelerate progress, not hinder it. Uh, so some of the things today and just permitting, and you can look at our industry, it's very difficult to permit a pipeline or new facilities, facilities these days, but it's also difficult to permit new uh, grid uh, investments uh, to move electricity around the country and uh, and build out the infrastructure uh, to support more renewable power generation. So uh, we need policies that support progress and development. Uh, they should ensure accessibility to all. Uh, you know, in California, you, you know, at least where I live up here in the in the Bay Area, you would think uh, you know everybody's driving a Tesla. Uh, the fact of the matter is the uh, the policy support that electric vehicles get. Um, it's not necessarily the most cost effective. Uh, it's several hundred dollars a ton of carbon abated. And it goes to people that generally can afford a Tesla for a second or a third vehicle. Uh, the people who pay for that in the form of the, the revenue source uh, are people who are lower down uh, you know, the income ladder oftentimes and, um, and, and can't necessarily afford uh, a new vehicle. They're driving a used vehicle. And so we need to make sure that we don't leave behind those who uh, are a big part of the population. And we've got to make the, uh, you know, these new technologies accessible. Uh, we should rely on market forces. Government's record of selecting technology winners is, isn't great. Uh, and so markets and competition uh, can sort out uh, ideas much quicker than policymakers can. Uh, Performance-based policies that set performance standards and then allow innovation uh, in, in how those are achieved. And then finally, transparency to consumers in terms of what this all costs. Here in California, uh, it won't come as a surprise to you that the, the price of gasoline is more than a dollar higher than the national average and much more than a dollar higher than much of the rest of the country as a function of policy choices that have been made in California. And uh, those aren't very transparent uh, to the average motorist. Uh, and if people had more transparency, particularly as those differentials widen out, I think it puts the public in a position to understand uh, the cost of the policies that, that have been adopted. So, uh, you know, I think the, uh, you know, the role for policymakers is to try to leverage uh, a set of principles like this to, uh, to set in place a framework that encourages innovation uh, at the academic level, in uh, the national labs, uh, in startup companies, in established companies, uh, so we can all put our smartest people to work on solving these problems in a way that's durable and affordable for the long term. So in that regard, you're diversifying uh, the production of energy at Chevron. Uh, for example, your, your work in hydrogen. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that and what leads you into research and development in, in hydrogen and other uh, sources of energy. Sure, so let me start with what we're not doing. We're not investing in wind or solar. For, for our own use in certain cases we are where it makes sense. But the technology is relatively well established. The costs are coming down. There's good developers out there. There's plenty of capital available. And we as a company don't bring unique capabilities uh, that, that aren't readily available uh, out there in, uh, in the marketplace. In fact, I'll ask our investors, would you rather me invest in wind and solar or return the capital to you in the form of a dividend? And you can choose best in breed uh, investments that, that you want to see in your portfolio on those technologies. So we've really chosen to uh, leverage our capabilities to uh, de develop lower carbon energy systems for the future. This includes decarbonizing oil and gas to a greater degree than it has been historically, 
And then also uh, renewable fuels, things like sustainable aviation fuel, renewable natural gasoline, renewable diesel, uh, hydrogen and carbon capture and storage that leverage uh, unique skills, uh, capabilities, uh, value chains, customers that uh, we know well. And uh, if we can help decarbonize uh, heavy duty road transportation, if we can help decarbonize aviation or steel and cement manufacturing with some of our industrial customers, these are the more difficult parts of the economy uh, to decarbonize. It's areas where we have unique uh, experience, technology and capabilities that truly can solve problems that are uh, the, the most difficult uh, problems out there. And so that's where we focused. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of uh, technology to be developed, new value chains to be built all the way through, uh, you know, from, from the manufacturing of things like uh, lower carbon hydrogen, green or blue hydrogen, all the way through to new engines for, uh, for the use of that, uh, the infrastructure and transport modalities, et cetera. Uh, so these are big, big challenges, but that's where we can, you know, those are the things we do well at scale, engineering, uh, execution of uh, the investments, the delivery of the technology, the management of quality across these complex value chains is, uh, is kind of in our wheelhouse. It's what we've always done. And that's where we're really focusing our efforts on uh, developing a low carbon energy system. So you, you've called uh, many times for a more pragmatic conversation about the future of energy. Um, can you sort of summarize what would that look like, the more pragmatic conversation? Sure. So there's really three elements whenever you get into a discussion about energy that, that are important around the world. Uh, the first is uh, energy is so fundamental to life that it, it enables economic progress and prosperity. And so affordable energy is, is a key element of that. Uh, the second one is energy security. And so if you go to sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, uh, you can't uh, build hospitals and take care of patients, schools, um, factories uh, to produce things if you have unreliable energy. And much of Sub-Saharan Africa, when I visit there, uh, the lights go off uh, every day. And, and so you have very unreliable. So, so reliable uh, uh, energy and energy security matters, uh, even in developed countries like Germany, as we're seeing now, and then environmental protection. And so you've got to find a way to balance uh, this issue of economic progress, energy security, and environmental protection and have a, a discussion that recognizes how important all of those are. If you over-index on just one of those, uh, you can get into an unbalanced position. Uh, you can make choices that have unintended consequences and create vulnerabilities. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, you look at Germany today, a, a very industrialized advanced economy uh, that has some of the highest energy input costs and concerns about whether or not uh, they'll be able to continue to supply their economy with the energy that's essential to its success. So this balanced, pragmatic conversation should start there, agree on how to frame this up. And then my belief is that the, the solutions are grounded in uh, technology, which has always been part of addressing humanity's greatest challenges, uh, human ingenuity to apply the technology in new and, and innovative ways, and then the power of markets to mobilize capital and human resources to apply these solutions at scale. And so all of this needs to happen, uh, not just locally, but, but globally. Uh, and, uh, and literally in the energy system that we rely on uh, every single day needs to remade, uh, be remade uh, in this uh, you know, uh, new and innovative uh, form. And it, it's going to take time in order to harness all those forces, but it's doable. I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, I've never been more optimistic when I look at the, 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 the innovation that's underway, some of the technologies that people are working on and, uh, and the capability of uh, the people that are coming out of great universities and come into work in this industry that, that are absolutely committed to taking on these big challenges. Uh, and we're almost running out of the time we have allotted, but you just led into a question that I wanna ask. So a number of our Anderson MBAs uh, work at Chevron, uh, but for our newly minted Anderson MBAs uh, who are thinking about their career, uh, what would you say to them about a career in energy, a career with Chevron? Well, it's, it's, it's the essential industry. And, and you know, I sometimes talk to my friends in the technology uh, sector and, and they like to say data is the new oil, but we use a lot of data and we also have the, the old oil. So it's using the data, uh, we have the old oil and the new oil. And how do we find ways to integrate these things to solve these big challenges and improve uh, the quality of life? The amount of innovation that I think we'll see over the next two or three decades, I've, I've worked for this company for four decades, 
I think the, we're going to see massive change and massive innovation at a pace, uh, just as we've seen in so many other parts of our economy, uh, that really will address these problems much more rapidly than, than the pessimists believe. And uh, it's just a chance to be on board uh, and help rewrite uh, you know, history once again in an industry that is just fundamental to, uh, to human progress. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I, uh, I'm glad that we've got many of your, your Anderson graduates working for us, and I hope we have many more. Uh, as do we. Uh, so we have reached the end of our time. Uh, Mike, I want to thank you very much on behalf of UCLA, the Anderson School and the Anderson Forecast for taking time with us this afternoon, talking about an important industry and an industry that is changing rapidly, as uh, you just indicated. Um, and so this has been uh, certainly a delight to have this conversation. Thank you for joining us uh, and thank you to our audience. Uh, this is uh, one of a continuing series of looking at important sectors that are affecting our economy brought to you by the UCLA Anderson Forecast.